thank you so much for tuning in to the Psychology Is podcast. I'm so excited to introduce my guest, Dr. Casper Addyman. Welcome, Casper. How are you? Hi, Nick. Yeah, it's great to be here. So, Dr. Addyman is a developmental psychologist and a lecturer at Goldsmiths University and the director of Goldsmiths Infant Lab in London and the author of the, the new book, The Laughing Baby, The Extraordinary Science Behind What Makes Babies Happy. And I read this book and found it extremely helpful as a parent, extremely interesting as a psychologist, and something that I think people can relate to whether they have a baby of their own or not, um, particularly people who are interested in developmental psychology. And my read on it was that the title's perfect, especially because it'll really catch people's attention, but you definitely talk about more than what makes babies laugh and what makes them happy. You talk about some of their cognitive processes, like their perception of time and the way they categorize things and what stimulates their curiosity and what surprises them. And so I think it's, it's a very well-rounded look at baby psychology. So as I was mentioning in our, in our preliminary conversation, I thought I would kick off our conversation with a fun question. Uh, and hopefully all the questions will be fun and interesting, but this one I think is particularly fun and interesting. And the question is, should we be tickling babies? And if you don't mind, Casper, I'm going to share a little story. So my, my, I have a couple brothers. One of them's name is Daniel, and he's just a year younger than me. So we share a lot of the same friends. And he's, he's particularly ticklish. And when we were all probably 17, 18, 19 years old, kind of peak football shape and just a very physical group of friends, we would sometimes pin my brother Daniel down and tickle him. And it was just a bit mean, but it was actually all in the, you know, in the jolliest spirit. Mm -hmm. And he would be laughing until he was crying, but also screaming for us to stop. And we would eventually stop. We wouldn't take it too far. But I thought of this because, you know, you talk about in the book and we all know that tickling is this very strange phenomenon that makes us just burst into laughter and yet we kind of hate it. We can't take it. It's overwhelming. And so I know you wrote in the book and I want to hear your, your thoughts on this, that some people say you shouldn't tickle babies because or it, the, you say that some people say if they can't talk, don't tickle them because they can't tell you to stop, even though they're laughing. But you disagree with that, if I remember right. So yeah, I would love to share with me your insight on whether we should be tickling babies. Yeah, so it is, um, it is a question that I think a lot of adults who do have that horrible reaction to being tickled and don't like it, um, or had the sort of those experiences being teased too much as a child, then feel like, oh, tickling is, is, is aversive, it's terrible. Um, and they forget that actually, um, and I, I do this in a lot of talks, so put your hand up if you don't like being tickled, and, and about half the audience will put their hand up. Um, and they forget that actually, um, for younger children, you know, it's a much smaller minority that find it aversive at all. Ma the vast majority of children do enjoy it um, within limits. Um, and so the real question is sort of like, how do you know the limits and what's what's going to happen there? And I think that's where um, it's sort of OK to tell people, yes, you as a parent, you as someone that cares about this person, you know, a younger sibling, um, uh, you can play tickling games. You're 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 not going to push it too far. Well, older siblings, <laughs> um, perhaps occasionally, um, but. With a, pair, uh, with a parent with a little baby, there's absolutely no danger that they're, they're going to misread the signals, in my mm -hmm. view. Um, but it's a, it is one of the, the, the fascinating questions. It's actually one of the first um, bits of uh, the science of laughing babies that ever happened, because um, in a paper that Charles Darwin wrote in uh, 1877, I think, in the, in the journal Mind, he, he kept a diary of, of his young son, Dobby, and um, sort of did all these sorts of little experiments with babies, 
um, including sort of tickling tickling his his son, deciding that it, it really works. Um, but he has this brilliant line in there that um, if a if a baby was tickled by a um, a strange uh, a strange man, they might la um, you know burst into tears. And I can just visualize Darwin the the competent sort of yeah the, the um, complete uh, experimentalist always gets his hands dirty mm. going around those victorian parks just mm. running up to babies and tickling <laughs> them and yeah that doesn't work so a stranger coming up and tickling you um it's uh even you know uh a baby that is ticklish isn't going to laugh they're going to they're going to scream um mm. so i th i think the the signals that you get from babies from that <laughs> aren't, aren't aren't a problem to interpret mm. This is interesting because it relates also to what you talk about in the book about how a simple touch is not just a simple touch and that we could be touched. It could be the exact same sensation of the touch against our skin, but the perception is very different based on who it is. It's very much related to our relationship to, to the person doing the touching. So it sounds like this, this relates to who's doing the tickling and you offer a fascinating explanation of why tickling makes us laugh and my interpretation was that it has to do with essentially being in this vulnerable position and yet there's this relief that comes with the perception that this person almost it, this could be a threat to me but it's not so yeah. will, will you elaborate on that just like basically why do we laugh like that when it's the right person tickling us yeah. Um, so I guess that sort of links first to the, obviously the, the first observation is that you can't tickle yourself. And so mm -hmm. that, that really is, um, you know, what's going on there. Um, and yet sort of the, the sensation is going to be the same. Um, but the context really matters for what the sensation is. And this, the first sort of theories, and we don't, don't really know is that part, the reason we're ticklish at all is, um, so that we we um, uh, avoid parasites and things that we can uh, push away ticks and fleas that might be um, sort of burning on our skin. So that's a you know, pretty gruesome starting point to that ticklish sensation. Um, but when that sensation comes from um, your mother or father lovingly sort of with a big smile on their face, um, creating the same sensation. Um, it's you know I, I compare it a bit like being on a roller coaster that you know it feels dangerous but you know it's safe um, and so yeah we re well those of us that go on roller coasters enjoy that uh, sort of controlled uh, controlled unpleasantness and I think mm. um, tickling has a lot of the same features. Mm. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. So, will you let me know just how you came to become focused on baby psychology. I would love to know your path. Uh, yeah, there's definitely oh, there's two stages to this. So there's one becoming a baby psychologist and then becoming interested in laughter. But um, from baby psychology, so I actually did my psychology degree um, at night school. I was working in um, uh, banking at the time, writing financial trading systems. Uh, my, my first degree was in mathematics. Um, and I, I realized I couldn't spend my life being a banker. Um, it was just uh, lots of meaningless numbers one after another. Um, and so in my, within my psychology degree, um, I was always quite interested in the, um, the more computational modeling end of things. It's like, right, people have, this was so mid, mid 2000s or 2000 and, or early 2000s, 2001 to 2005. Um, so it was the, the early days of um, neural network modeling. It's like, oh, that as a, as a so computer programmer and numerical person, that seems like the, um, the coolest bit of uh, sort of understanding how the brain works. Um, and within my, psych within my degree, um, the developmental psychologists were the people at my university who were doing those, that modeling, you know, which when you stop and think about it, makes a lot of sense. A lot of the early sort of simple models um, that people were trying to build of the brain 
weren't of elaborate adult level language or adult level you know visual perception they were all toy models and they were sort of mapping onto the level of ability that you might have in in the first few years of life hmm. so so early on in my sort of degree it's like wow i like i like the neural networks hmm. i didn't realize i like babies but yeah that that seems like a a good place to start if we if we want to learn build models of how the yeah, the brain and uh, cognition sort of bootstraps itself get started I'm going to have to know how the actual brain bootstraps itself, how um, we all get started. Mm. Um, and so I was very lucky that you know um, I was at um, Birkbeck in the University of London, where they have something called the Centre for Brain and Cognitive Development. Um, we have a, a very uh, wonderful, a large team of, of people doing infancy research and doing that, that nice combination of uh, infant research and um, computational modelling. Hmm. I know you've done m many different experiments and studies and yeah so, so early on I was looking at um sort of uh baby's first abstract ideas sort of how how do we know um a concept that you can't see in front of you so yes and no are obviously like early things that um you, you never see a yes you never see a no um, the one I looked at was same, same versus different. Mm -hmm. So when, when you pick out that two things are the same, independent of the fact that they're two cups, two cars, two boats, two shoes, um, what, what is the first age that you're able to do that? Um, and humans do it very early. Um, ch chimps, pigeons, lots of other species, even, even bees can do it. Um, but we can do it very, very quick. Um, and so it's an interesting um, thing to study. And then went on to look at uh, a few things like time perception, um, early language learning. Um, and that was, that. Yeah, you know, I still, still do some research on those things, but um, drifted over into, uh, into laughing babies. Mm. And although it sounds like adorable and cute and i'm sure it is it's also a rigorous you're a scientist with it you do rigorous experiments and and research so i mean i'm sure you can speak for hours about what types of studies you've done in the past so maybe i'll just zero in on are you doing any kind of current research and what um so we've yeah we've we've just finished one study where we um had parents doing little jokes over Zoom. So we had five different jokes um, and the webcam recorded what parents did. So you'd eat each one three times. Um, so one of them would be just doing peekaboo with your child. Uh, another one, um, they, they, they actually, <laughs> um, did, it, did the child laugh at that? Um, uh, Another one, just a more conceptual joke of here's a soft toy, um, maybe it's a, a, a toy dog or a toy cat, and then you make it go moo or something. Um, so we film the, film the reactions and just to see how quickly the, um, the babies respond and if they find it funnier as you repeat it. Um, so that, that's been one, one direction. And then I've, I've got um, other research that's currently looking at um, the the uh, emotional content of music and how do babies know whether some music is happy or sad or things mm. like that. On that note right there, I was planning to ask you this a little bit later, but it feels relevant now. You did a collaboration with the musician Imogen Heap and yeah. created a scientifically based song meant to make babies feel happy. I think it's called the happy song, right? How did that how did that collaboration come about? Yeah, so that uh, that was um, 2016, I think, and there was a um, a, a baby something called the C and G Baby Club, which is like a, a Facebook group for, for for parents, and they wanted to um, create something to sort of promote their their brand. Um, so they had these people in advertising, and, and one of whom had had just been to a concert for dogs in uh, Central Park. Um, the 
the artist and musician Laurie Anderson had had done this. So she's playing her violin. Um, I don't know if she tuned it up to be ultrasonic so that the dogs might hear it, but it was very, very successful. Dogs loved this violin concert. Um, and so uh, Kiara, the, this uh, advertising person, thought, I wonder if you could do the same for babies. Um, and that was the, the kernel of an idea. What, what would be a song to appeal to babies? Um, and so then they looked around for experts in, in babies and music and two down, doors down the corridor from me um, I have uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Lauren Stewart, who's a professor of music psychology. Um, so they got in touch with us um, and then went hunting around for musicians who'd recently had babies, um, found Imogen Heap, who um, she's, uh, yeah, she's won, I think she's won two, two Grammys, one for being a producer on Taylor Swift's al early mm -hmm. album. Um, when, when we started working with her, she just finished doing the music for the Harry Potter play. So mm -hmm. it's like, was quite intimidated because I was completely unmusical at that point and I'm still pretty unmusical. Um, but yeah, my job within that was um, if we want to create something that makes babies happy, how can we be sure? How can we test that in the lab? Um, so Imogen created some bits of music. We brought them into the lab. We had 20 babies come and see what they thought, mm. uh, measured their responses. Uh, Imogen went, went back again, re, recompiled that, turned that into a whole song. Yeah, which is, it seems to have worked. We've had millions and millions of uh, views on YouTube for it. Um, and I yeah, get parents informing me that, you know, they, um, they have, you know, Alexa, play the happy song as a, uh, as a useful go-to uh, mood manipulation in their house. So At the, at the time of us having this conversation, my wife is pregnant and we're expecting a baby in June. So I'm sure I will be using it plenty. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And I know I, I listened to the song and yeah, I mean, I, I love Imogen Heap's music anyway. And it's got that signature sound of her music. And it's just, yeah, it's just uplifting. So you basically chose the segments of music she sent you a bunch of samples and you had 20 different babies listen to it measured their reaction how did you measure their reaction um so we had we had this is sort of like classic science uh problem so we had grand ambitions that we were going to um measure their physiology um and so we had we'd, we'd strap them together with heart rate movement we would also put them in we put them in a baby bouncer to see if we could, uh, are they going to dance more to mm. music? Um, but we also actually asked the parents, well, is, is your baby enjoying this? Mm. Um, and then got um, uh, some blind coders to watch the videos in silence and say, right, where is this baby having the most fun? Mm. And, and actually those observational measures turned out to be the reliable ones. And, um, the, the more fancy motion capture and physiology um, was just in the, without having done any piloting of it, we just you know, didn't get a reliable signal in the time available. Mm. So um, it was- But there. yeah, that, that was, they had eight, eight different little pieces of music that they had to, to pick from. Um, and then one actually turned out to be a really clear winner. Um, that had actually originally been hummed, Imogen had heard her daughter sort of humming something. So music really runs in that family. Mm. Uh, um, and then Imogen developed that into a whole song um, based on lots of other advice about um, making it interactive, making it um, a, a female voice um, actually recorded in the presence of a child makes a difference. So the previous studies of um, compared a someone just singing a song to a child or imagining singing it you know without the child present and children prefer uh the one that was that was done live so like make sure that your daughter is in the, in the room when you're recording it that's interesting uh, it makes sense 
there's yeah. probably subtle, if not drastic ways that we kind of change how we're singing and yeah, I mean, we're always changing our tone of voice when we yeah. talk to children. Um, mm. And so infant directed singing is just similar to infant directed speech in that respect. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, that what a fun project and congratulations. Oh, and, and then it, it, it was also, you know, Imogen probably would have insisted on this anyway, but we didn't want to drive parents mad. So <laughs> these have to be played on repeat. And so you right. don't want it to be crazy. Yeah. Right, right, yes. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Baby Shark song, for example. It certainly <laughs> yeah, hits with the kids, but I think it drives parents crazy. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. So when it comes to the question of how do you make babies laugh, which is no doubt one of the most satisfying experiences. I remember very clearly, I have a son who's at this point seven years old. And I remember thinking, especially during a certain phase of his life, that it was the purpose of my life to be making him laugh. <laughs> and I hope to keep that alive for my whole life, really. But especially when he was like a baby and a toddler, um, it was like my, my own little challenge. Like the first thing I need to be doing in the morning is making my child laugh. And I, I suppose I could really revive that and continue to maintain that goal. But it's just such a satisfying experience to make a baby laugh. So everyone wants to know, how can we do it? Whether it's our own baby, whether it's other people's babies. I think of the categories of like our own kids, maybe our nieces, nephews, cousins, brothers, sisters, our relatives, and then friends, babies, and then strangers, babies, all these degrees of separation. So I want to hear you say this, but I just want to also highlight one thing you say in your TED talk, which is basically pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And, um, I would encourage watchers and listeners who haven't seen yet the still face experiment to look that up on YouTube and it'll probably be, the, you know, the top result. If you look up still face experiment will be this famous study done where, you know, a mother shows you the contrast in the baby's response to her being very interactive and engaged and really paying attention and in a lively way versus just staring at the baby with a blank stare with no expression yeah. and it's a little different i know because she is technically paying attention in that she's staring but she's just non-reactive and you see the distress that this causes the baby so i just thought i would bring that up feels relevant make sure i put it on watchers and listeners radar but back to the question now so talk to me about that how, how can people make babies laugh and is there a difference depending on how you're related to the baby yeah well so Obviously, you're, every day you're going to have to find something different to make them laugh. But the, I always say that the, the core essence of making a baby laugh, whatever the circumstances, whatever the relationship, is, um, and perhaps paradoxically, take them seriously. Um, so the, the thing that makes them laugh, the thing that um, at the core of it is your attention and your, your focus on them. Um, and so by thinking about, right, I'm taking them seriously, what are they interested in? You're getting yourself into that, that dimension of like relating to a child. Mm. Um, now that's going to work a lot better than just steaming in, waving your arms and right. Woohoo. Woohoo. Right. Um, which you might be everybody's first reaction to right to be, to make a baby laugh. We have to be silly. It's, it's actually you have to be present um you have to um give them the sort of the quality of your attention which you know that young children can never have enough attention from from adults that's um that's what you, you will always find and that they they learn so much from that because what we what we want to learn about in the world um and you know young children all look up to to other people we want to learn about other people they want to learn from adults um they want to as much as possible be able to interact with us as equals um and anything where you set that up sure you know sooner or later the laughter will follow um mm -hmm. because i think that's in my view that's a huge part of what baby laughter is there for is um 
to sustain those really high quality interactions. It's it's their way of rewarding you and keeping you sort of, you know, their their operant conditioning, if you like, of their parent, mm -hmm. of, you know, rewarding you for doing things that they'd like you to keep doing. That's fascinating. Yeah, just to highlight that it's it's their way of sustaining high quality interactions. That's really yeah. that's really insightful. Yeah, and that's 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 my feeling. And um, I yeah, as you say, if you want to keep your the same child laughing, you're going to have to do something different every time. And you know, the the best person to tell you what's it they're interested in today compared to yesterday is is them. So so start off by letting them lead the interaction. Mm. You also mentioned that this is actually this translates to adults as well to making adults <laughs> laugh and just being you know having a fun relationship with an adult is to pay attention be present take them seriously which i kind of interpret as like be perceptive in the interaction and one one question too on, on this note that i have for you is so i notice in my relationships with my family with my friends that a lot of my hardest laugh laughs come from kind of inside jokes in a way mm -hmm. it's like the you know the eruption that is based on layers of past interactions and meaningful little inside sharings yeah. so i'm curious to know is there any version of that with babies so i'd love to hear you speak to that as well as hear, i'd love to hear you speak to how this all translates to adult relationships um yeah, so I guess there's there's two two questions there. One is like the the the, the in jokes, the family jokes. Um, will can can that happen with babies? And I think absolutely can. Uh, we'll we'll come back to that in a second. I guess the other other part is um, you know, the things that make us laugh as adults mm -hmm. um, are. Well, I say this with children, but it's true for adults. It's not things; it's people. It's mm -hmm. uh, you know, we laugh most with the, the the people that we we care about and that we share things with. Um, and th th this is like uh, what's been found by adult laughter researchers. So the most famous there would be Robert Proving, who um, what used to. Um, sit in university cafeterias eavesdropping on students conversations to see what was causing them to be laughing mm. um, and discovered that over 50 percent of the cause of laughter was not anything you would ever call funny it was it was not jokes as such uh or him as an outsider didn't see his jokes there are lots of things like somebody would arrive at the table and say sorry i'm late uh and then other somebody else would say some some make some response yeah no problem or yeah okay and everyone would laugh and it would include that person in the group um and the laughter is completely like driven by the social relationships mm -hmm. um and that's that sort of often gets overlooked by other academics who want to examine the sort of the cognitive dimension of humor they really want to pick it apart for um right what's the you know, what's the, uh, um, the, the, the norm that's being violated here or whatever. Uh, and, you know, really overlooking that laughter starts out, uh, originated perhaps, you know, in evolutionary terms as a bonding mechanism, as a way of connecting. And that um, sort of the, the core of it is, um, you know, feeling that you you're um, reinforcing and sort of sharing something with that person it's, it's a reciprocal um, thing so you know in jokes are a brilliant way uh, you know of doing that because that is something that you only share with that, that right. person um, hmm. the I guess the the thing that you um, whether you have that with children is yeah I um, absolutely believe that you can people assume that children have um poor memories but actually they they really don't they um they will remember something that happened four or five weeks ago and it'll suddenly come back to them and they know that 
um, this particular toy frog has that funny voice that you do for that for toy frog. Mm -hmm. And so they're always going to expect it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you can build up uh, your, your own, uh, you know, repertoire of uh, the um, internal family jokes that uh, yes. mean so much to you all and that um, you have to be there really to, to exactly. understand. Yeah. Exactly. I think I remember correctly that in the book you talk about, I believe it's your niece, but correct me if I'm wrong, but you describe this progression where it was in the tickling chapter, I think, where you would kind of tickle her with a like a funny growling voice. And then you could just put your hands like above her belly and just make the tickling motion and, and she would laugh in the same way. And then you could just do the growling noise without the tickling <laughs> and she would laugh. And then you could, the, you got to the point where you could just kind of give her a certain type of glance and that would induce the giggles. Was that your niece? Did I have that right? Um, that that uh, wasn't, I think that's, that's a, uh... Um, I think that's just a, a general story okay, of sort sorry of. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. it's, it's linked to um, it sort of explaining what Robert Provine thinks was the very first joke. So he right. he says that you know tickling somebody is a is a stimulus response. That's that's not really a joke, but going in to start tickling somebody and not doing it mm -hmm. is is a cognitive thing. It's now the funny bit is actually in your head. And so that we can call a joke. Um, and sort of, you know, if you go back 2 million years or however far you go back, um, you know, that that would be sort of a, a, an example of uh, you know, laughing just conceptually um, and that you can tick that off and call it a joke. And that's a, and that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful idea. We'll never prove it, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a supporter of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and, and it's interesting just again, to think about like adult laughter and inside jokes and we all maybe are too shy to admit it, but I think we all want to be funny. We all want to be able to make people laugh and there's the people who do it on stage right like in the us perhaps one of our most famous comedians right now is kevin hart and he can just stand on a stage and make an entire stadium of people belly laugh and it's astonishing how talented he is at that and and i'm sure that you know you could really scientifically analyze what it, the structure of his jokes and how things are, end up being connected in his whole routine etc but I also have this sense that that's probably not the way that most of us will be able to make people laugh in, mm -hmm. in, in the way that comedians do. Some of us have that knack, but I think my impression, again, based on my lifetime of observations, is it's much more related to high quality interactions with the person. And in time, you just have more and more experiences that you can kind of recall and tie into the present moment, for example, imitating something that you both observed a kid hilariously do a year after the kid did it something like that right where it just becomes this mm -hmm. inside joke where an outsider looking in like you mentioned with the experimenter wouldn't consider that funny or understand why it's making you two laugh but it does so <clears throat> and it's beautiful to think about this as like a evolutionary evolutionarily based bonding mechanism it certainly feels like that yeah, I and mean, I think if, like all things in um, in human abilities, you you want a, a a compelling reason why it exists, why it's there at all, um, and um, things like language uh, and uh, abstract thought, thinking about the past and future, they they all have an obvious mechanism. But things like music and laughter, um, you know. They they clearly serve a purpose, but it's it's harder to tell that sort of story. And once you do start to think about it, um, you know we you know it's lost in the mist of times. We ne we will never never really know. But it's worth trying to put together a, um, you know a full story of where those things come. And um, you know especially you know me having been a researcher looking at babies, realizing that it, 
it's you know when you're looking for the origins of things you can look in the deep uh, evolutionary past or you can look in those first couple of years um, and when I saw that laughter was so central in those first few years and it's like really key um, a, you know a great leveler between the parent and the baby or between the baby and anyone like oh yeah that that points out that you know laughter has this social mm. type, type role for babies and maybe for the rest of us too yeah that, that uh, um, it starts to um, make sense actually it's very weird that um, so Robin Robin Dunbar was sort of one of the first people to propose that um, laughter has this social dimension to it that it, um, along with um, sort of gossip it's one of the um, the ways that we kept our groups together as our group size got bigger and bigger um, and he's looked at the sort of the us compared to other primates and sort of they spend their time grooming each other we spend our time um, just sitting around in small groups sort of um, uh, shooting the breeze mm -hmm. gossiping um, you know quality time i guess mm. um and strangely enough he just completely overlooked babies as as, as part of that uh, he's mm. like right it's a good mechanism for adults but i think it's an even stronger mechanism for babies where um you've got this very very complex world that you're coming in social world that you're coming into um and lots of it is going literally over your head as well as metaphorically um and you know they need to they need to get themselves started in like how do I be a human? What do I what is being human about? Um how how can I get involved? And I think you know, uh laughter is is one of their little, you know, the clever evolutionary tricks for um right, yeah, the, this is this is something that actually um it, it it doesn't require the complicated cognitive mo models or theory of mind to get it. It just needs, I'm connecting to you. I'm, you know, I like you, we're, we're, we're sharing something. That's why I, almost every talk I ever give that my favorite quote is from comedian Victor Borge that um, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. Um, and yeah, I think that puts it, into a very important place in sort of our social social development. Mm. Beautiful. Do you find that the ways we make babies laugh are universal across cultures, or is there much cultural variation? Um, as far as I've been able to find, so I did a, I did a survey of about um, 1,500 parents um, when I first started looking at laughing babies. Um, and it was quite heavily biased to sort of uh, uh, English-speaking countries, so Britain, Canada, and, uh, and the United States. Um, but I had, had um, respondents from... Uh, at least 60 countries, uh, 60 different countries, or even if I had one or two in each each case in some mm. of these. So it would be nice to revisit that and try and get a um, a much more comprehensive uh, sample. But so, so to pick one example, um, the the most popular game for making babies laugh all over the world is is exactly the same. It's peekaboo, mm. um, and that, I found that consistently in every. Every country where there was a, like a, a significant number of, of participants, mm. um, and yeah, you know, the the reason why that is, I think, sort of does tie in quite closely to everything else we've been saying about laughter. That this is pure connection. You know, can am I connected to you or not? Mm. And um, yeah, you know, it's not a coincidence that that's why it's the most popular game all over the world. Um, but yeah, then other things, um, there, there are clearly cultural differences as to how um, parents relate to their children. Um, and um, that's not something I've yet got the data to explore properly. Mm. Yeah. 
another question I have for you is, why is it, and I don't think this is only my observation, that sometimes babies and toddlers, when they are perhaps just exhausted at the end of a day, like this is what I have found, that they, when they're prone to meltdowns, they're also prone to pure laughter. Right. And so sometimes there's like, I, I don't know, maybe you can explain it better than me, but it just seems like going between those two extremes sometimes happens mm -hmm. easily when they're in certain physiological states. So how do you make sense of that? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I think, think you're right. Uh, I think the sort of uh, sometimes called the witching hour, you know, witching when, hour. Uh, <laughs> when this little creature could transform quite easily into uh, uh, a bundle of trouble. Um, and I guess the, the, the thing to think there is, is to do with um, self-regulation so that the, the tantrums we can see is a, is a complete failure of, uh, of self-regulation. You're, you're much more or unbalanced in terms of you could easily go off in that direction. And I guess, you know, it's as much um, in the other direction. So um, uh, I haven't looked at this myself, but the, my, my friend uh, Sam Wyas at the University of East London is, is trying to do a lot of research looking at babies' own abilities to self-regulate under different circumstances. And then, you know, a lot of the role of parenting is, is to provide that regulation that babies can't do for themselves in, in lots of different situations. And I think, you know, when you get tired um, and maybe this is another situation where we, and not just babies, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. adults, you know, have you, are you hungry? Do you need, <laughs> do mm -hmm. you need a nap? Uh, things like that. Um, mm. Drunk adults, you know, <laughs> that can easily go either way, can't it? Great example. Yeah. And that's kind of like what a baby or a toddler is like at the end of the day, like a drunk adult. And so, so you're saying this kind of subdued self-regulation is explains why a kid might be prone to tantrums or my, why a drunk adult might be prone to a tantrum or an emotional meltdown and also why they might be prone to bursting into laughter. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, when you remove that uh, ability to self-regulate, you start in the middle, but things can set you off in either direction. Yes, that makes sense. And it has me wondering too, I wonder how much of our adult self-regulatory habits prevent us from laughing as much as possible. It's interesting, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our attempt to be so sophisticated and collected all the time, maybe that's one, yes, preventing us from having emotional meltdowns, but also maybe it's preventing us from bursting into laughter more often. Yeah, the lows aren't as low, but the highs aren't as high. You exactly. know? Yeah. yeah, interesting. What about speaking of, you know, meltdowns and stuff? I know that every parent listening can relate to the agony of when you have a baby who's just inconsolable. And when, you know, it's it's really astonishing how loudly a, an infant can cry it's truly amazing to me and so what guidance would you offer a parent particularly of a very young child when that child seems to be inconsolable yeah um i mostly offer my sympathy because i think that there are certain times when <laughs> there isn't anything that's gonna um soothe them instantly that they are they're so ex extremely worked up that mm -hmm. it it just has to, they just have to get through it um and and maybe that is like a starting point that that sometimes right there isn't always something you can do um so um or something you can do to fix it you what you can do in those situations is um yeah you are you are calm and you're there for when they do do recover. Um, the I mean, 
the, the other things that sort of work for, um, and there is, there is actually some research, I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, the research that did it, who does um, look into tantrums, has looked into, right, what's going on there and what are the best ways out of it. Um, so one good way is obviously distraction. You know, if you can, uh, um, if you can get something that's genuinely distracting, and that gets through the um, the fog of this situation. So, um, my uh, colleague Natasha, uh, when when her young children were in tantrums, occasionally she uh, it's, and it's almost like a you know, Zen monk or something. She she sort of bang them in the stomach with her head. She was like, what, what? They were so bemused by what had happened that they, <laughs> they forgot what they were crying about. That'll uh, break through the I had a whole sequence of these. Mm -hmm. Right, what can I, how can I uh, um, make you forget what, what was going on in this situation? Um, the, the one thing you can't really do, in, um, even with toddlers, is to sort of try and use reason to get them out of those situations. You know, what's wrong? You know, oh, it's not as bad as you think because it's not a cognitive thing. Ultimately, it's an emotional thing that starts. So um, it doesn't help to start sort of trying to talk them down from where they are. You know, it's much better to. Uh, are you feeling very sort of validate their feelings and to sort of let them know that you're aware of how they're feeling? This is an important reminder. Yeah, it's sort of because it's it doesn't come naturally. We 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 want we're problem solvers. We want to try and solve the problem. Yeah. Um, but that that comes after the comfort. I think you know do the comfort first. Right. Hmm. There's something you mentioned in your book that was very intriguing to me, which is that you believe that babies are living a meaningful life and yes. that it's it's easy to kind of look at a baby and see how they observe the world and just the mode that they're in and assume that there's not you know the level of self-awareness necessary to have to feel like your existence is meaningful but I, i'm intrigued by this idea that that they're experiencing yeah. a meaningful existence so can you tell me more about your thoughts on that i, I thank, thanks for picking up, up on that i think you're the first person to have sort of really noticed that bit which i think is a um it's one of my um sort of favorite things about right why what is the explanation of why babies are happy um mm. yeah, part of why they're laughing more than we do is that they're they're happy um and so I went to look at the adult literature on on, on happiness. So the um, uh, all of the research about self actualization, and then the um, the real um, connection I made with babies was in the work of uh, Mihal Csikszentmihalyi, who, um, as I'm sure you know, is the um, originator of this idea of flow. Um, and so people often get caught up on the idea that. Um, that's just about um, like an athlete being in the zone or something. Um, but for she said, Mahali, flow was a, a, a more of a lifelong process. It's really about, and um, you know, he was looking for the happiest people um, when he started his research. So I'm going to go and find the happiest people in all walks of life. He found these people um, and then tried to discover what it was that that they all had in common. So these were um, bakers and postmen and people in, uh, on life sentences in prison. Um, and there seemed to be this defining characteristic that they were much better at getting into a flow state. They, they spent more of their time um, really absorbed in something in front of them um, and absorbed in, uh, in doing it well. So the goal of a flow state is that your it's peak performance, mm -hmm. um, and so that um, could be your peak performance as a baker. That right today, you know, I'm going to bake the best loaf ever, and that you really care about all the little details. Yes, um, it could be you know, as a prisoner that uh, well, within the confines of what I've got in front of me, I'm just going to have the the best day I can have. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but in all cases, they, they're present in terms of what's happening to them right at the moment. They're very um, engaged with trying to improve. Um, and so that, you know, I think that's a compelling um, story of what is satisfying for adults. Um, and it actually is something that Aristotle said as well. He said um, that happiness is achieving mastery over the world. Um, uh, so it's it's not a not a new idea by any means, um, but I think yeah that actually is one of the best explanations we have as to why babies are so happy is because every day for them it's a a, a, a challenge to master a new skill, hmm. um, and every day or every other day perhaps there's a success. In, in mastering something. There's something they did today that they couldn't do yesterday. Mm. Um, because the other part of sort of um, being successful with that, that sort of thing is that the more you do something, the more um, you need to keep, a, keep the challenge going. And so as for adults, that's why um, we fall away from being able to, to be satisfied. But for children, there's always a new challenge around the corner. Um, and it's um there's always um a sense of satisfaction of right i today i learned you know a new word and i'm going to use it uh several times uh mm. or you know this is the first time i've been able to use the knife and a fork mm. uh um or to you know the, the standing up the smile you see on a baby's face when they know that they're walking and succeeding in something like that mm. you know and it's a challenging thing for them to be doing that. It's not just, ha look, I can walk. It's, oh gosh, oh God, oh, but I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Um, and yeah, so I think they, I, 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 I've, I'm gonna start using your way of phrasing it, that yeah, this is, this is meaningful. Um, and this is a, a source of their satisfaction. Yes, the source of their satisfaction, yeah. I mean, is that something you've seen with your own, own children? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And my, yeah, you know, I have many nieces and nephews as well. I have my own son and in all of them and in all of the kids I've observed, I had this really fun day for, for one of my classes. I teach a developmental psychology class and we had a kid day and mm. it was, it was super fun. And we basically, my students were held, holding down different stations and we had a fun card. So each kid and we had kids as young as my brother's at the time, four week old child up to 11 year olds and everything in between. And each kid got a fun card and they had to go to each station. And some were super simple, like go try to pop these bubbles. And then some were like we, we proposed Kohlberg's moral dilemma, the Heinz dilemma <laughs> and had kids respond to that. And we had, of course, um, the Piaget station and had them observe you know, the, the laws of conservation. And we had just multiple stations here. And it was just, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to observe it all. It was such a wonderful experiential learning. And even to watch just in our own little Petri dish that was that experience, kids of different ages and the level, I would say for all of them too, this was true even for the 11 year olds, that the process of engaging in whatever each station, whatever the purpose of each station was, was inherently satisfying. And that's what I feel like, you know, you're speaking to is the inherent satisfaction of the process, because in a sense for a child, nothing is yet mastered. And the process of mastering it is very satisfying. And then of course, they eventually do master it, right? Like by the time they're four years old, they've mastered walking. And that too is this paramount moment of satisfaction. But but it's I think the the big difference that I observe is that kids find more satisfaction in the process than adults seem to find. It seems that we become adults and things become more of a means to an end. And yeah. it's important to have ends. It's important to have goals. And I, I took that from the flow. I read the book flow as well. And 
I, f- I think that having goals instills the process with greater satisfaction. It gives the process more purpose. And yet it's still very important to find satisfaction in the process. And kids really teach us how to do that, I think. Yeah, and, and it's sort of, it's, it's easy for us to forget that because, you know, we're, um, we think we are, we think we are masters of everything or we think we've learned how to learn. And, and really um, a lot of learning type things are, um, it, it's more abstract than you think. <laughs> uh, the, the, the process by which you're doing it um, is is different from what you what you assume, which is why it's so difficult to, to be a teacher as well, I guess. Mm. Um, that you know, we're just trying to motivate you to to do this for yourself. Um, we're not pushing knowledge into your head. We're point, sitting you next to knowledge so that you're um, going to engage with it. Um, yeah, nice. There's something else too that comes to my mind related to this topic, which is. I find that what tends to um, pull people out of a state of flow is the stream of thinking. It's, it's when we really get into our heads and we, we are caught in the web of abstract thought. And abstract thought, of course, is an extremely important tool and accounts for much of our technological advances and things like that. So it's super important and a key part of being human. And I think it can be a major source of, of suffering even, and just distraction. And I think it is what exactly what um, interrupts the experience of being absorbed in the present moment and in what I'm doing. And it's, I'll be curious to know when you think abstract thought really emerges for children. And I'll just say too that it seems that that's a major factor in, again, interrupting the flow state. And so mm-hmm. very young children are not kind of not burdened by that yet. And it seems to be their natural default yeah, mode to be absorbed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so I guess this is like um, almost a like Vygotskyan idea of like inner speech. And yeah. he felt that's really important. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd probably agree with you that it's it it could dominate things to an extent that you know you you're losing those more um, implicit learning mechanisms as a as a result. Mm. Um, I haven't yeah I haven't followed my my expertise sort of peters out that more beyond two or three you get where obviously you're still pretty not um, pre-verbal. Um, in, in those days, so I I don't know so much about um, when we're sort of doing everything through inner speech and through talking ourselves through a problem, mm-hmm. um, and the extent to which that can uh, sort of d- disrupt things. Yeah. I, I must go away and look it up. My one of my favorite examples of those is um, the. The book from the 70s called The Inner Game of Tennis, which was a huge um, bestseller about how to be better at tennis, that was actually almost um, like a an introduction to, to Zen, <laughs> Zen meditation in a way that it mm-hmm. was just don't think about it, try and try yeah. not to think about why you're why you're doing what you're doing. And mm-hmm. I, um, I have a friend who's like um, a a sports coach at a very high level and a lot of what he's trying to do is to to you know to get you to switch into that um immediate sense so does um lots of um exercises that are about you know i know you want to examine this sort of intellectually but that there's a different time and place to doing that and that that that's what a coach is for a coach can do that for you um your job is you know to actually be do- doing whatever it is you're doing mm, exactly um, yeah. hmm. so i think yeah i would be i'd be curious to know like i don't know how many listeners are this would apply to but i imagine there's some people out there who 
you know, so many people want to study psychology. As you know, it's one of the most popular majors. And yet I, I see it very clearly being a college professor that so many people want to. They're very intrigued by psychology. They feel like they might have a knack for it. And yet they don't know what they would do with that degree. And it is, it is true that, you know, it's difficult to establish yourself in a psychology career with a bachelor's degree in psychology. Most people who become established in a psychology career have a graduate level degree in it. Um, so, but, so my question is for people who, who are very interested in this exact line of work, because I know they're out there, um, what would you suggest? What would you suggest from the, the point of, of the bachelor's all the way? Like how far do you think it's important to take it? And how might a person get involved in studying babies? Yeah, uh, so I, I think, yeah, I guess it's, it depends ultimately is like what, what, you know, where you want to, and in fact, maybe that's why I say where you want to end up, but actually when you're starting out in, in a degree, it's not necessarily the best advice to try and think about where you want, want to end up. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, um, stay in the educational system as long as that is uh, working for you but you know if if you've got to the master's level and it's just oh you know the requirements for the statistics is just too much for me um right that you know should i try and force myself through a phd at this point it's like no you've 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 hit a level um and now you want to direct your energies in a way that you know plays to your strength. Um, and I, um, you know, my I mean, my own career, there were lots of um, serendipitous moments and sort of unusual directions that I didn't expect to take. So um, planning it out too explicitly uh, is tricky. But at all of those decision points, the choice I made was based on. Um, wow that sounds interesting so uh a night school degree in psychology that sounds interesting the oh i didn't even think about studying babies until i was trying to yeah, build these computational models um that led me down this path uh the laughter you know sort of i uh, ch chose to do this and you know when i think about the, the my friends who've had the most sort of satisfying career paths very few of them can say that they they set out with that intention. There's usually, um, right, well, I, I got to this stage in my education and then um, you know, I just opened my eyes to the possibilities and discovered, right, oh, with a psychology degree, you can now go and do speech and language therapy. You can now, you know, if you go into nursery education, you will come to it with a completely different experience um you know in um in parenting sort of if you were interested in babies things that are um coaching parents on how to be parents is now sort of a growing field um and one where you know, it's just that classic thing of if if that's what interests you you will become an expert in it um with with time uh so it's yeah you know, I, I don't have I don't have a one or two sentence sort of summary as to what I tell my my students as to how to make their decisions. I don't know if you've got a good um, a bit of advice that works for everybody. Um, Not necessarily. I think the way I approach it aligns with how you just described it. And it is interesting. I'll just emphasize for myself, too, that the things I do now, the opportunities that presented themselves to me, were unpredictable and and so i think yeah i think it's 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 a good approach to like you said stay in the education system for as long as it works for you continue to invest into yourself and and your own skills and knowledge and then at all of those decision moments which is a good way to think of it decision moments follow what is really truly meaningful and interesting to you and then because it's probably true that most people who are, for example, in an undergraduate psychology program now, 
you just can't predict what opportunities are going to arise. And it's, it's good to have some direction and it's good to balance that sense of direction and planning with embracing the mystery of the path and, and how you really don't know what lies ahead. So, and I know many people, they, they just, I mean, I think honestly what's at the heart of many people's trepidation about choosing a major in psychology is the question, am I going to make enough money? I really think a lot of it does come down to that. And it's, it's a very fair, practical question. Is this a career that can sustain me? And will I have my needs met? And it's not easy to just answer that very clearly. And interestingly, and this is perhaps a plug, I'm kind of um, planning and organizing um, what I am going to make into a video of a bunch of panelists who are psychologists where I'm going to ask all of them, you know, of course they'll volunteer to be part of this and they'll, they'll know the questions coming, but straight up, how much money do you make? Like, mm -hmm. and I want to have a like, therapists and researchers and social workers and professors and all the different things you can do as a psychologist represented on the panel. And hopefully it will be a really valuable, you know, video for people. Uh, yeah, that sounds like uh, definitely that has not been done and uh, it, it would, you know, really yeah be interesting to to see that and and to have people be open about that sort of right. thing as well as to right well you've you've made these choices and this is where you are um uh and to be happy with that because i i think uh, as you say it's sort of um to focus on the the end goal of how much money you make then if that's your starting question and psychology is not the, the place to start from. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that was actually the first choice I made when I did my math degree is like, mm. uh, well, I don't really know what I'm doing when I finish my math degree. I didn't do brilliantly out at it. So I left the education system after just my undergraduate. I don't know what I, what I want to do with it. So the most amount of money for the least amount of work or is going into, into finance, into the... Mm. City of London, our, our, our version of Wall Street. And yeah, it was a fun, fun for a few years until it's like, oh, I've, I've chosen this for the wrong reasons, it turns out. Mm. Um, and yeah, the, but you know, maybe I had to have gone through that to then be satisfied and be happy with some the the, the actual value I get of my current job is well, the delight of meeting lots of the babies and the satisfaction of of trying to, you know, understand people that little bit better. Mm. Yes, beautiful. I was going to comment on that earlier, just the, the beautiful contrast between your first and second careers. <laughs> and I imagine, yeah, it's a good point that perhaps this one is, you know, you have no questions about it and it's all the more satisfying because you have that contrast of your first career. Hmm. Yeah, and, and and I have you know quite a lot of colleagues who are also you know both in psychology or the ones who have left. It's like I've tried this for a little while, and it's okay to to change your mind and sort of try something else. Hmm. Um, I don't know how it is in in the states, but in the UK, people get to their late twenties when they've got a mortgage, they then get a bit terrified of that um, taking that plunge and changing. Right. And I think that's what leads to lots of midlife crises and, uh, you know, um, depressed adults is that you, you stuck somewhere beyond the point where it was easy to change. I think we can change at any point, but it just gets harder the longer you leave it. Mm, great way to think of it. Yeah. Well, where can people find more about you and more about your work? I know you have a you have Twitter account, you have websites, you have your book. Will you just kind of plug that information here? Yeah, so the, the the best place to start if you are on Twitter is Twitter, which is um, Kzpr, so C-Z-Z-P-R. Um, and then on there, there will also be the link to the my book website, which is laughingbaby.info. Um, so mm. that sort of um, includes the book. It has includes sort of little essays I've done about different topics from that. 
um, and includes quite a few laughing baby videos as well. Parents mm -hmm. over the years have sent me lots of videos and I always challenge to try and interpret um, what, why is the baby laughing this time around? So, mm. yeah. Love that. I'll, I'll put those links. Yeah. In, and then if, yeah, if there are you know, students who are like interested in, uh, you know, this sort of uh, academically and want to follow it up, then just go Googling me, you'll find find my sort of um, university pages. Mm. Perfect. Well, although we could certainly go on for longer, I, I think this, this is a healthy stopping point. And I just want to thank you so much for spending time with me and sharing your expertise about such a great topic. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's nice to have the chance to do it at this sort of extended length. Mm. Often you, you do things in sound bites and I like the way mm. you you're you're not in that rush you're you're let letting me give you the longer answers and, uh, and then we're following it down so it's been it's been great fun thank you you're very welcome happy to be connected with you happy all of our listeners and watchers are now aware of you and yeah let's let's stay connected yeah cheers nick yeah cheers if you like this video and you want to see more please subscribe